for you to be able to hear about how the sound quality is too. Mm -hmm. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the common room. <laughs> Cheers. This is a really this is a really new thing for us guys. We're just we're just jumping right in. We uh, we talked about we try to balance how this came about. We try to balance on the podcast wanting to have free flowing conversation, but making sure we're staying on topic. We really want to keep it on the chapter, not have the beginning introduction part be too long, but still have some stuff. And so throughout all of these conversations, we realized it could be really great for us to meet once a month in this common room, as we're calling it right now, the common room. I really like that name. Andrew came up with it. And, and to have way, way, way less structured conversation. Yep. And just for example, in the previous episode when we were recording, David or Andrew brought up cruciform love. And I was like, oh, that's going to be something I would love to just dive a little bit deeper with hmm. Andrew on. I don't know yet if we will here. I'm not trying to hijack this yet, but um, <laughs> that's an example of this. Or just to talk about how Lewis is impacting our lives, to talk about how the four loves are receiving it in a much more casual sense. There's so many things we can use this for, but we wanted it to be a uh, very different feel. And so I guess the reason I'm giving this mini monologue at the beginning is to hopefully you enjoy this, but we'd love feedback and have a little grace if this first one is, there's some road bumps maybe. A little bumpy, yeah. A little bumpy. <laughs> well, and I also, um, I think that it comes out of two different loves. Um, one of it was love for you, our listeners. Um, we really appreciated the surveys and the feedback that we got at the end of last season. And we wanted to make sure um, to kind of trim down the chatty uh, that we were doing in the episodes. And we were grateful for that feedback and wanted to accommodate that. And hopefully you've been finding our episodes um, uh, that we've gone on a talk diet a little bit um, and have stayed closer to topic. But, you know, I, I experienced this, especially my first year um, uh, coming on, is that, you know, whenever Matt and I would record a, an episode, we would spend the first 20 minutes and sometimes the best comments just chatting before we started recording because we just enjoy each other. And so I think of this as a celebration of friendship. And uh, there's this great picture in Tolkien's letters. Um, in fact, you guys keep talking. I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to pull it up. David, are you familiar with common rooms? And Matt, have you I mean, how is what's a common room in England? Uh, a Picture common room is usually a recreation room in a building that's uh, some kind of institution. So it can be a school, it can be a monastery. It's basically where you get together and socialize. Mm -hmm. And that was what they called the room in the kilns uh, next to the dining room where they would sit by the fire, pour out the ashes from their pipes onto the floor like animals uh, <laughs> and uh, have good conversation. Uh, it was it was good for the carpets, Lewis said, and I actually got to visit some rooms in Maudlin, and there are moths um, that were that would fly in the windows um, from the deer garden. Uh, the deers attract these moths, and and Simon Horobin, Professor Simon Horobin, showed me the little moth trap in his room. Um, but uh, so there, were, and there's a senior common room and a junior common room in most colleges. Is that right, Matt? Yeah, at Oxford they have a. It's called the JCR, the Junior Common Room, and yeah, there were different levels and different ones. They don't have that at Notre Dame. They do in the dorms have common areas, but they don't call them quite as formally the common rooms. But uh, Oxford very much so had that. The JCR was like the hangout spot. It was the same at my school. Mm. You know, Andrew, while you're looking that up too, I'm glad you mentioned what you mentioned. It made me think of another thing, listeners, that I'm looking forward to out of this is selfishly a chance to chat with you guys in a more informal setting. Unfortunately, all three of us have very busy lives and it's very easy that we jump on the calls. We have maybe 15, 20 minutes to do a little bit of a life catch up, but we're, we're recording. And then because you only have so much time in life and then we're done and we don't often take a lot of time to just chat mm -hmm. uh, about life. Honestly, the pre chit chat is us catching up <laughs> for the week. Um, and just, and some people did say that they actually really liked it. It was just because some people said that just get on with it that mm -hmm. we thought, okay, let's let's trim it back a little bit. Uh, but maybe that's actually a good place to start. Uh, we sent out these surveys and we got back lots of lots of responses. I think about seventy in the end. Mm -hmm. And yes. we we then had a meeting and we looked looked through all of them and tried to think what we could change this season to uh, not maybe please everybody but please more people. 
Yeah, I, I want to start by saying, first of all, the overwhelming praise you guys were incredible. And the because because part of it was what you like most about the podcast and some of the the feedback was just really heartwarming uh some of you took the uh direct constructive criticism to heart and we appreciate that too yeah <laughs> there was only a couple comments that kind of pierced me uh, and then you just have to be like oh, those are my okay. favorites <laughs> <laughs> i told i told marie what to write <laughs> i was like you know it was it was though a healthy dosage of humility and Sometimes you need to you need to hear the tough things, and we really did, and I meant it. And you guys listened to it of just giving us really genuine feedback, and positive and negative. And of course, overwhelmingly, it was really kind and positive. But there was some direct stuff, and that was nice. That was good to hear. Sure. And it was actually super helpful. Well, and if we're just doing this because the three of us love talking to each other, that's going to go nowhere, you know, unless it's <laughs> serving, you know, other folks. This is great. So Tolkien's letters are a treasure. To, unfortunately, they're abridged. But there's one letter from, uh, there are very few letters between Tolkien and Lewis. Um, but he does send him one in 1948. And so this is towards the end of... Um, of the Inklings. So they ended in 1949. Um, but they met weekly, sometimes twice a week. And they met in uh, in the pub, usually just for talk, the kind of thing we were doing now. They didn't bring their manuscripts to the Eagle and Child. So it's good to clear up that nonsense. They brought their manuscripts to Lewis's rooms. Um, but, but Tolkien gives us, so evidently there had been some kind of misunderstanding or hurt feelings or something and um, Lewis evidently wrote Tolkien, and Tolkien replies um, to kind of explain uh, why he was miffed or whatever. And uh, he says, um, uh, I write only because I find it easier to say such things as I really want to say. If they are foolish or seem so, I am not present when they fall flat. And then he says this great thing. My whispering asides are most often due to sheer pusillanimity and a fear of being laughed at by the general company. To be pusillanimous means to be cowardly, right? Mm. And so he's saying to Jack, when I whisper stuff to you, I'm only whispering it to you because I'm afraid that I'll be laughed at by everybody else. So you see this wonderful, intimate insight. Um, and he says... Um, this requires this letter. This requires no answer. But as for yourself, rest in peace as far as I am any critic of behavior. So evidently, Lewis apologized for what he thought might, may have been an offense. And he says, you are the faultest freka uh, that I know, which means, I think, the most uh, faultless, yeah, the most faultless knight. Oh, uh, you are the faultless freka that I know. Loudness, did you say? And let me see, there's another note on this. Um, uh, it appears that, uh, that Hugo Dyson um, uh, had been putting it about that Tolkien objected to Lewis's loud manner in the Inklings. So there's the people are talking junk about each other in the Inklings. <laughs> uh, loudness, did you say? Nay, that is so largely a self-defensive rumor put about by Hugo. Hugo evidently was very loud. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, remember that they that the working title for Great Divorce was Who Goes Home, uh, this book about hell, and they had nicknamed it Hugh Goes Home. Um, <laughs> I never. No, all, I kind of like that title, Who Goes Home. Uh, I think the Great Divorce confuses a lot of people mm -hmm. when they hear that title. It doesn't lead yeah. to the proper assumptions of what it is. Yeah, and what a beautiful thing. I mean, coming home. Who right. goes home? There's, there's just something warm about that. I think. But who goes home to hell too? Mm. Yeah. Right. So it's because meant what to you be... make your home. It's like it's having your home is how your home. Yeah. Um, if this is best book. I mean. Yeah. Well. No. <laughs> oh, but... did we just uh, a little Freudian slip there? No. Nah, <laughs> nah, nah, no slip at all. Um, <laughs> it's funny because we're recording this episode, but in the episode that we just recorded, as soon as Andrew started talking about till we have faces. I just took a very slow drink. I could see <laughs> Matt laughing at the side. <laughs> oh, I missed it. Well, and, and I th really think that The Four Loves is to have faces written out in prose. Mm -hmm. um, he it, goes it, on to so say... Just you know, Andrew, yeah. I, I love 
because I think it's really important in seasons. I could be wrong with this to have these sort of inside jokes. So I love to keep playing them up. Oh yeah. And so I like making the inside joke of we're going to drink every time Andrew talks about the four love. <laughs> or, uh, the Till we, have, Til we faces. have faces. But I actually do think it's really important because Till We Have Faces being so difficult and to unpack the first read through, someone can go through our four loves and the more you t- you connect it, the more they're actually getting answers to it. So obviously, well, you know, I was joking, but just so sure. No, no, no. Know, like, and it's, it's, it's certainly, certainly a pure joke. <laughs> It's certainly a matter of taste as to which of these books you like the best. And everybody's entitled to their opinion. I'm sure Jack would would have agreed. And I'm not sure what Joy would have said about it. But he did call Tilia Faces far and away my best book. But the great discovery for me was to realize that the four loves are operative in Tilia Faces. And they those were both written with Joy Davidman in the room. Um, once all four loves had really come together uh, with Lewis. But let me finish this just real quick because it's so good. Of course. Um, Let's see. We are safe. This is Tolkien saying to Lewis. We are safe in your presence and presidency from contention, ill will, detraction, or accusations without evidence. Doubtless, as you say, I have as a member of the Brotherhood a right to criticize, if I please. But I shall not lightly forget my vision of the wounds. I shall be deterred from rash dispraise for myself. So praise or dispraise, right? So evidently, he said something and Lewis maybe took offense or was wounded by it. Indeed, I do not really think that for any man, valuable, for any man, valuable criticism is usually attained hot on the spot. It is then too mixed with mere reaction. Let us listen again more patiently. And let me beg of you to bring out the oh hell with no coyness, the Oxford History of English Literature, which is still in the offing. But I warn you, if you bore me, I will take my revenge. (laughs) It is an inkling's duty to be bored willingly. It is his privilege to be the borer on occasion. I sometimes conceive and write other things in verses or romance, and I may come back at you. Indeed, if our beloved and esteemed physician, that's um, Humphrey Havard, the useless quack they called him, um, is to pose us with problems of the earth as a dynamo, I can think of other problems as inc- intricate, if more petty, to present to, to his notice. If only for the malicious delight of seeing Hugo, if present, slightly heated with alcohol, giving an imitation of the intelligent boy of the class. But Lord save you all, I don't find myself in any need of practicing forbearance towards any of you save on the rarest occasion when I myself am tired and exhausted. Then I find mere noise and vulgarity tiring, or trying. But I am not so whore, meaning so old, nor so refined, that that has become a permanent state. I want, you to, I want noise often enough. I know no more pleasant sound than arriving at the B and B, the bird and the babe, the eagle and child. I know no more pleasant sound than arriving at the B and B and hearing a roar and knowing that one can plunge in. Yours, J R T. So, <laughs> what a great insight into friendship. Speaking of Tolkien, yes, Andrew, you might be left out of this briefly, but yeah, <laughs> how about that Hobbit smoke, David? <laughs> weirdest thing that matt has ever sent me was it what? not great though uh if you go to pintsofjack.com and you click on the blog depending upon when uh how, how how much i post before this gets published uh matt sent me a stand-up comedian it's uh so speaking in the person of tolkien as though he's turned up at his literary agent uh and his editor uh to find out that all of the reference to hobbit milk have been cut out of his manuscript it's really disturbing, really weird. So um, I posted it. It's, oh, wow. it's funny. So Andrew, so he's essentially going on like, what? and he, the, the, first of all, the stand-up comedian really gets into it. He's like, where's the Hobbit milk? How could you cut this? He's, he's getting into it, going on and on and on, talking all about it. It's about five minutes. But at the very end, and there's some good, funny, witty stuff throughout it. But at the very end, he goes, you have the nerve to talk to me that way. You're just a disrespect for the elders. If I was that way with my mother, she would have beaten me with five milk cartons and said, Jared Tolkien, why haven't you gotten the milk because we're poor because of you? And he, and he goes, and he also looks away, he goes, oh, cut it all. Cut it all. <laughs> he realizes he essentially was traumatically wounded by his mother and has some weird issue with Hobbit. Oh, you got to send this hilarious. to me. 
It, it was good. Well, go to pintsforjag.com and you can watch it. It's very weird. I would suggest listen to it with your headphones on so Kristen doesn't hear what strange things you're watching on YouTube. Just oh, she suggestion. might be down. <laughs> or it's a big, uh, it's a big Tolkien family. We have a whole lot of Tolkien shirts. All the more stuff. reason. All the more reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, but there it is. What we're talking about, uh, uh, some of our heroes. Uh, I did want to briefly address an email that we had recently. I did, I did reply to it personally, but somebody was a little concerned that this season we seemed much harder. On Lewis, hmm. uh, and I, I, th- I thought it was kind of funny because in the past we've had people write to us saying that we're basically doing hagiography, that we're praising Lewis too much, not <laughs> pushing back on his work enough. So it's, it's sort of the position now where we can't please everybody. Uh, but what were your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we are being. I mean, I think the short answer is, I'm, for me personally, I actually can't speak to you guys, but. I just very pragmatically approach most things. And so I think Lewis is incredible. You're seeing the thing where it says something went wrong during the recording. Please have Matt refresh the page and continue. Okay. Oh no. So we're trying this out. So hopefully he will be back. And there he is. <laughs> Our listener just went, nope, we're not listening to this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I know the listener and have had, oh boy, there he is. Uh, I have had some correspondence uh, with this person and and respect them very much. They were big support during my Till We Have Faces recordings. My Till We Have Faces recordings. You guys need another drink? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go all Till We Have Faces references <laughs> at the beginning of the episode and then see David try to guide us through <laughs> So, respect to Biggle. <laughs> respect to Biggle. <laughs> um, Matt, and... I'll just reboot your machine. All right, we'll see you in a bit. Um, I absolutely, you know, I mean, I'm one of the biggest apologists for Lewis, meaning a defender of Lewis. But I'm a defender of Lewis, I hope, not because I'm just a homer for Lewis, but because I found him so helpful and so reliable. And mm. so... Um, there is absolutely no danger of me dis- disrespecting or disregarding Lewis. And I don't know, um, there may be 20 people in the world, who, I, I think, who hold Lewis in as high a regard as I do. Um, and maybe that's an exaggeration. And people, people he, he's beloved by me. And I, what Lewis said about McDonald, I certainly say about Lewis, I owe him as much as one man can know another. Actually, that's what he says about Kirkpatrick. Um uh, he calls McDonald his master, and I call Lewis my master. I have found him so reliable on so many things. Um, so, um, and Lewis himself really loved the students who would disagree with him, even though he was much smarter and much better educated than most of them were. Um, but he says in some of his critical correspondence, such as that with um, E. N. W. Tilliard in the personal heresy and, and, uh, and T.S. Eliot, he said, in such matters to find an opponent is almost to find a friend. Um, and Barfield talks about, in I think Poetic Diction, talks about Lewis's role as an opponent. And um, Diana Glyer talks about how the Inklings work together by opposing each other. So um, when I disagree with Lewis, or if I don't understand him, usually it's my own fault and I need to grow as a thinker and reader. Um, but I think that um, it's because I'm engaging with him. I think Jack would have rather liked that. And I think that, mm. you know, my big hope is if I could have caught him out on something at some point. <laughs> what yeah, about you? I mean, he, he even wrote in the margins of some of his own books. Uh, this was unclear. I think he sent it to, he sent the abolition of man to his former philosophy professor. Mm-hmm. And the philosophy professor went, what does this bit mean? And he went, 
yeah that that that's kind of unclear and yeah. our mutual friend dr stephen Beebe, in his cs lewis mm -hmm. and the art of communication he's praising lewis throughout saying what a great master communicator he is but he does also include the sections where it's like mm, this bit wasn't so great and that for me uh, uh that for me is definitely true for some of the early chapters and even some of the later later parts of the four loves i think it's one of his his most not provocative, but it was the it was the book that really made me start to think about things that I had just simply been assuming. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought very deeply about the nature of love and the different kinds of love and yeah. how each can go bad. Mm -hmm. And so this was really a book I, I really got my teeth into and started struggling with in the best possible, best possible way. way. Nice, nice and, 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 that's, and that's, that's why David, David now agrees, agrees that Till We Have Faces is the best, best book. book. No, no, no. Oh, oh sorry, sorry you, you missed that. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. no. You were talking, talking about, about the, the four, four loves and the book that you really kind of got your teeth into. Yeah, I just really got my teeth into it. Uh, but I, I still think that it is not some of his best writing. It's certainly not some of his clearest. And particularly given the kind of job that I'm doing this season of writing the summaries and taking us through each of the sections, I notice sometimes where he mingles things a little bit together. It's not as clearly nice and neatly separated as it possibly could be. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of his references are kind of hard. I mean, when you read Surprised by Joy, there are a lot of literary references in there, but he has many more of them littered throughout The Four Loves that for a modern reader, that needs some explaining. Hmm. So, well, real quick, guys. I, I yeah, does please. Does it sound like it's coming through my microphone or the computer? Say it again. Sorry, what's your asking? Keep talking. How, how is my sound quality right now? It's yeah. a little echoey, but it's not bad. I think it's coming from my computer. It won't let me change to my Yeti. It says while it's recording, it can't change. And so I will not be able to talk okay. to my Yeti. Okay. <laughs> so listeners, uh, a little okay. of first technical difficulties on Matt's end here. but <laughs> And lean in a little closer. You get less echo if you're closer to the computer. Yeah. Closer. Ah. <laughs> closer. Can you hear me now? Closer. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Andrew, you fooled it's me there. mighty Matt. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, and then I always want to kind of connect it with biography. What's going on in Lewis's life? So where does he write the most clearly? And what's happening in his life when he writes the most clearly? You remember that he didn't have time to endlessly revise a lot of his work like Tolkien did. Tolkien was a professor. And as a professor, only had to write and give lectures. Uh, he didn't have to take students for pri private tutel tutelage, as Lewis did. And so... Um, the Chronicles of Narnia are sometimes inconsistent because he dashes them off at the end of a long day with a lot of other work. He's also a public figure answering two hours a day of correspondence. Two hours a day. I mean, he answered every letter he ever received. He answered 50,000 letters. Wow. Um, and Walter Hooper said his motto was, when in doubt as to whether or not an answer would be helpful, go ahead and answer the letter. So... So maybe, and at the four loves, I'm guessing that he must have written it between 58 and 60. So this is as the cancer is beginning to return for Joy Davidman. And even before the cancer returns, he's busy just talking with her, which he loves. He's busy being married to her. And so maybe the elevated nature of the conversation, um, which he'd never had before in the kilns except with warning, uh, is maybe contributing to that too. I don't know. By the way, I fixed the mic, I think. Good. Should oh. sound better. Sure. I don't mean to jump in and, and hijack this, but one thing I was somewhat no, jump. curious about, if this is a good transition point, since I just missed the last five minutes, but what has been, so we've been going to the four loves so far, and something that I always love to think about in every chapter, but in this case, let's just think about it from the beginning of the book to where we are uh, as of this recording. What have been one or two big takeaways you guys have had that are more takeaways geared towards changing the way you approach life potentially, you know, something that's actually kind of impactful takeaway, uh, some knowledge change. And if you don't have any off the top of the head, I can kick it off. But if you do right away, I'll let you guys do. Know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Jump in. Yeah, I would say there's been, there's been a couple of things, but the first one from the beginning that did really hit me was very similar to the great divorce where it was the, the expression that will be done or that will be done and you, you choose which way. Similarly, his expression of when love becomes a God, becomes a demon. And it's not that part. And a demon will always for, uh, disappoint you. Will or not break keep his, his promises. promises. Not keep his promises. Mm -hmm. 
that has been sticking with me mm-hmm. because how often I, I can, I'm not going to, I'm not that vulnerable of a person, but I could list about five things that I have made demon gods and they become demons because I think they're going to, I think they're going to they keep these certain promises, essentially promises of happiness, joy, peace, contentment. Yeah. The things that we're all mm-hmm. somewhat striving for in life and they constantly break it. And just a reminder, almost asking myself on a daily basis, is this going too far? And am I making it into more or less a demon, a God, but then a demon? And telling myself it's going to break its promise. And almost using that as a bit of a mantra. Like that that really stuck with me. You know, that's the thing. That's the reason I love Lewis. It's that sort of thing, this bon mot, this kind of good word. And Lewis has so many of them that I can hang my life on. Yes. Right. So many of those things where it's like, oh, I'm putting a second thing in the place of a first thing. I should be careful of that. Oh, oh, I must be going through the troughs and the valleys right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, you know, I'm committing the error of the Stoics in my prayer life, thinking that I can always do what I can sometimes do. I mean, phrase after phrase after phrase after phrase. That's a good one, Andrew. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, it's almost almost like he's a fan. I know. You're piercing me with all of those, especially that prayer one recently. Yeah. And that's just why I love Lewis so is because there's so much great advice about just about every area of my life that I care about. You know, I'm about to go over and help my wife babysit while the family has their singing date. And I'm going to be practicing not a lot of eros or philia. I'm going to be practicing a lot of affection, you know, because there's going to be four toddlers in the room. They're all three or younger. I'm just going to love them because they're my family, right? Um, and Lewis helps me to understand that that's where that is. So for you, it's I the affection me, side towards your family, essentially what you're saying? Tonight it is. Okay. Ask me in five minutes, it'll be something else <laughs> and often from this book. No, really. I mean, this book I come back to again and again and again, and I find it as rich. I think mere Christianity is also uh, all, as rich. You know? So, mm-hmm. yeah, what about you, David? I would say it's your favorite quotation from this book, or at least what you've probably quoted the most to us over the course of our time together. It is uh, the human mind's tendency to praise or dispraise rather than define and describe. And we even had somebody recently in one of the Facebook groups that they, that they sort of waded in with a value judgment. And mm. I resisted my first urge to slap them down. Uh, and I first of all began with, what do you mean by... And uh-huh. it's one of the terms. Well done. And just, just the value that that has for improved conversations. That yep. when we take a little bit of time to think about what we are actually saying and to listen to what the other person is actually saying, not all of the things that we associate with this trigger word here, uh, our conversations are greatly improved. To say the thing you mean, the whole of it, and nothing else. That child is the true art and joy of words. It all comes back from till we have faces. <laughs> it, oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drink too. I was wondering what you were about to do. Oh, it's peach soda water. That is so good, David. Well, I am out of scotch, and we said we would keep this to half an hour, and that it was just going to be free form. At the moment, we're talking about doing this once a month. We will see how we go. We'll see how much people get out of this and also just how much we enjoy it because that might just be reason enough. Uh, But let us know if you've enjoyed this and we will hopefully over the coming months iron out all of the various uh, technological kinks. Well, and you've got 45 seconds left, Matt. What about cruciform love? You want to end (laughs) us with that? Yeah, it's going to go longer, 45 seconds. Sorry, David. Um, I'm going to give you 60. (laughs) No, honestly, so I do that quarterly retreat in Chicago, and it talked about, it used the term cruciform love that had a definition for it. I actually believe it brought in Callistos. It did, definitely brought in Callistos Ware, a metropolitan Callistos, oh. where that same retreat, I believe he's written on that topic. He was talking about it from a theosis perspective. They use the term cruciform love. Short answers, I believe they were using in a very similar vein as theosis. Uh, Christ the cross that type of cruciform love being transformative in our lives and the way we would say theosis, Christ forming within us, 
you know, that is in, uh, in our, both of our denominations, I believe, through the Eucharist is a very important part of that, which is the Paschal Lamb, the sacrifice. And so there's a lot there with just very transformative power of Christ working within us. It is blurry for me, but I'm hoping... Oh, that's a picture of you with <laughs> Metropolitan? No way. Oh, yeah. Andrew, you know. you're way cooler than I am. As one does. You're way cooler than I am, Andrew. <laughs> no, I'm just flexing. So now for you, 60 second, what, what, what is it? What, what, when you use it, do you use it in a similar sense, or did you mean it? Define and describe what you mean. When I think about cruciform love and the, the kind of centerpiece of my ministry... And it's going to be the centerpiece of my priestly ministry simply because it's the centerpiece of what I need most. It's my, it's, it's, it's my own need crying out. Um, I think, and, and perhaps I'm projecting on all the world just what I need, and I need to you know, give some thought to that and care. But I think that the big problem, if Jesus said that the two kind of weightiest, most ponderous commandments are love God and love neighbor, those are the two things that I must do and busy myself about. And that's the summary of all the law. So cruciform love to me, but bef but it says, is it John? It says we love because he first loved us, right? And so I can't love God unless I have first mm -hmm. been loved. And we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And I can't truly love myself unless I perceive myself in the image of a loving God who created me, mm -hmm. right? So for me, the first part of all of that is grappling with the love that comes from God. And how would it be if I really lived a day as if I believed that God was, that I was the beloved of God, that he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, that he stands by my bed all night long, mm -hmm. nudging the angels going, hey, he's going to roll over. And start snoring. I love it when he snores this way. Watch this. Watch this. <laughs> that the Lord is always present and delights in us as a father delights in his children. And I don't really believe that down to the ground. Anything like half of the way that I, that I should. I don't either. And if I did, that would transform my life. Mm -hmm. That's the vertical part for me. And then my response is horizontal. I need to love others starting with myself, with my wife, with my friends, and then all of those that I'm around. And then I need to return that love to God. So I think of it as cruciform that way, right? The love comes down from God. I shed it abroad in my hearts and I love God in return. That's what, that's mostly what I think of it when I think of it that way. Sorry, David, screw your 30 minutes. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a follow-up question. I got to ask this question. Um, Andrew, as you know, in your wisdom of, of the pastoral side of things, how do we foster better? Because that understanding and that feeling, and I know feeling is kind of a bad word, but belief into our core of the love of Christ, because I struggle with it all the time. Your question sure. was a beautifully phrased question. How would I live if I actually believed it 100%? You know, there's days when I believe it more than other days. Um, there's days when I almost don't believe it at all. Know, due to shame yeah. and, and guilt and it just plagues me and so when you think of that like what would you say to a person to help foster that cultivate that um I'm, yeah i'll stop talking it's that it's that phrase from mere christianity i wish i had at the tip of my tongue he says that's why um uh, we must therefore train the habit of faith mm -hmm. and that's why we have to present the word of god and the traditions and everything to our minds on a regular basis. For me to live, the way that I do it is I have to spend time in his word. And for me, I mean, I got a tattoo that says thy loving kindness, thy steadfast love in Hebrew, because I need to be reminded of it so much. And the reason I got it in Hebrew is you find that phrase steadfast love um, more in the Psalms than anywhere else. So especially when I was going through great grief and real difficulty, I spent as much time as I could in the Psalms every day because I found that comfort of thy steadfast love and the angel of the Lord camp encamps around those who fear him, mm. right? You know, there's so much about God's loving kindness in the Psalms and elsewhere in the scripture. Reading Romans was a big help. Um, I surround myself with people who, who, like Mark 10, Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and loved him. And I surround myself with those people, I try to, who really see what a jerk I am and love me anyway, right? And you guys are You're a great welcome. example of that. 
you know. Yeah, I, let me get it out of my mouth. Jeez, Bates, come on. <laughs> David. No, but your forbearingness Savage. with me, your, your, your flexibility with me has been an example of God's love. And so I try to remove, and then I have to guard my eyes. I mean, there's so much unkindness mm-hmm. and hatred in the world. That's part of why I don't participate much in the political process. I'm too busy about the kingdom of love mm-hmm. to be really involved in the citizenship, you know, political questions because those don't foster love. They foster, uh, they foster hatred. Um, and so I try to put myself in that environment, uh, praying with icons, silent prayer, gazing into the gaze of God, looking into Christ's eyes and seeing his loving kindness, seeing the tenderness between the the Theodicus and the baby, Mm -hmm. right? The, the, the blessed Virgin looking at the child and the child looking at her and loving her, you know, looking at those examples of purity of love. I'm not good at it, which is part of why I surround myself with symbols of it all the time, because I need constant reminders of the loving kindness of God. That's why I got a cross on my other arm, Mm -hmm. because God goes on showing his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So the cross is a reminder of God's ongoing love when I don't deserve it. So that's that those are just some of the steps that I faultingly take and I'm not very successful at it. I think I can And I'm a big that fan of icons. I'm a big fan yeah. of icons, but I went one step beyond and made myself a living icon, my son. And oh. it's my interactions oh. with him. You know, when I, when I when I see how I feel about him, this big ball of need uh, mm-hmm. is 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 that how God feels about me? <laughs> and mm-hmm. and when he's kicking like a crazy person as I'm trying to change his diaper, is that how I am when God is trying to love me and wow. uh, you know, take me to a good place and I'm fighting him every step of the way? And then when it's done, it's like, oh, oh, that's better. I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> you got yourself in this stinky mess and you can't get yourself out of it. And I'm the only one who can save you for it. And you're fighting me every inch to keep me from cleaning you up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's not a bad metaphor. That's such a good analogy. (laughs) The theology of dirty diapers. I see a sermon coming. I think the big thing, if I had to summarize what I'm hearing here, and my own personal journey would echo this. Uh, My friend's dad once said years ago, and I think it applies here, what you feed yourself will impact who you are. That beats Mm -hmm. through your eyes. Uh, that means through your senses, all of your different senses. And so the content you're consuming, and Andrew, you described so many different examples of feeding yourself the word of God, feeding yourself images that let you see and experience in a different sense what the word isn't showing you as much. Um, in my case, reading different books that seem to stress it. But it's just keeping sure. it at the forefront. And probably the biggest takeaway I've learned in my entire spiritual journey is it's very hard to experience the love of God if you're only spending a few minutes with God a day. I don't want to be little, small amounts. I know people are busy, but I think as I've gotten more and more into my own journey, I feel more comfortable really encouraging people away from just that. Um, and I actually, I like what Father Mark Mary once said on our interview. He goes, pull up your phone, look at screen time, and then for then try to tell me you ha- don't, you can't find more than five minutes for God. I think there is just so much truth for that. If we really want to find time for God, if it becomes a must, not a should. We will find the time, you know, must Mm. become what they need to be and they will be done. And so 30 minutes, 60 minutes, there's no exact time. But if you only spent five minutes with a loved one, do you think you'd really feel loved by that loved one? Um, Mm. And so you just gave a bunch of examples. David, you gave an example indirectly. I have different examples, but I think that is just so key. And I say that as someone who's not doing it quite as well as I have in the past. And so I'm not feeling it as much. And it is kind of my fault. Um, David is right. Uh, and so anyways, I, I appreciate you sharing all that, uh, you guys. Well, you know, remember what he said in screw tape, there are only three kinds of things that we have to do that we do the things that we have to do, the things that we ought to do and the things that we want to do. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and that's part of why I carry around the rosary that you guys gave me. And one of the prayers that I pray on the beads, I know it's part, not part of the Hail Mary, but it's a prayer that I wrote myself. And I just pray on the beads over and over again, the love of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord, the love of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord, the love of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I need to be reminded again and again and again that the fundamental fact of the universe is this overflowing love that God has for all that he has made and that his nature is love. And that I need to surround myself with that. I love it. 
I feel like that's a pretty decent hmm. way, David, for you to wrap it up for us. <laughs> well, in that case, uh, everyone, please join us next time. When we go in further in up. In the common room. <laughs> and further in to the common room. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers Version one. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm off to show my love by babysitting. <laughs> Enjoy. I'll see you guys later. I'm going to go and uh, relieve my wife. All, All right. right. Cheers. Give her our love and Alexander, um, too. See you guys. Lily. Bye. Bye-bye.